look at, you can think of this school as a, as a great meal where we get all kinds of great physics and we learn all kinds of things. And if you have a great meal, you have to finish with a great dessert, right? <laughs> because otherwise it's not a meal, right? So, so uh, Marcus was complaining that he was the right, uh, last speaker, but actually the reason he's the last speaker is that we need a great dessert. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Pierre. <laughs> I was not complaining, I was just pointing out. <laughs> I was observing. <laughs> it's a mutual way of complaining. <laughs> okay, so um, I stopped yesterday and said, um, um, before we now uh, see how well reasonable or crazy uh, this idea is to go to um, very large masses and large coherence times, uh, let's first briefly see um, where we stand with respect to macroscopic physics in today's experiments. Okay? I mean, this is not an exhaustive review, of course, um, but gives you a little bit of a glimpse what uh, type of experiments are out there. A little bit of, again, historical um, remarks that I always um, put them in at the side about macroscopic quantum physics. Can you trace back sort of the roots of, of, of these discussions? Um, I told today at breakfast that I like to um, go to the library and um, just dig in old letters and so on. So here's a letter that I found when I came to Vienna in the Schrödinger archive. So there's an archive of letters that Schrödinger got and so on. So this is a letter from August 35. Okay. So uh, last time we had we were it's December 31, so now we're in August 35. Um, this is already after the EPR paper, and, um, but it's still before the paper where Schrödinger then came up with Schrödinger's cat in the 35 of December. Okay. Dear Schrödinger, yeah, so this is Einstein writing to Schrödinger. Um, and Einstein already was in the States, of course, yeah, as you can see. Um, dear Schrödinger, you are in fact the only human with whom I really like to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he uh, um, so continues to write, then, although in our expectations of where to go, we are the strongest antipodes. Anti-what? Antipodes. So the, the strongest, op uh, opposite, so oh. strongest oh. opposites. Uh, opposites. Yeah. What does he say? What? Only other Kerl. Okay, I just put it in German. Right? Okay. Um, uh, fast alle die Kerl, fa um, fast alle die Kerle sehen nämlich nicht von den Tatbeständen aus die Theorie, sondern nur von der Theorie aus die Tatbestände. So, so um, all the other, all the other guys, uh, they do not see um, the theory from the facts, but um, only uh, the facts from the theory. Oh. Ja. Sie können aus dem Einwand angenommenen Begriffsnetz nicht heraus, sondern nur posierlich darin herumzappeln. So, once they are caught in their net of Begriffe, net, Concept. of, net of concepts, they cannot any longer um, get out of it, but they can just, um, like a fish, you know, in the, in the dry water, can actually go back and uh, can only uh, like do random walks within this. Um, Du aber schaffst es nach Wunsch von du, du aber schaust es nach Wunsch von außen und von innen an. You, however, um, you just uh, um, uh, can view it as you wish from the inside or from the outside. Hmm. Although in our expectations, we are the, where to go, we are the strongest antipodes. What does he mean? It's about the interpretation of the wave function. Hmm. What the hell does that mean? What the hell does Psi refer to in the real world? And actually, Einstein, Einstein writes in his letter that uh, look, Schrödinger, you just blatantly wrong. Okay, your view of what the wave y function actually is, what it refers to in the world, is way too realistic. Okay, and um, he continues um, to give an example why he thinks that Schrödinger is wrong. Okay, so, don't worry, I read it. He says, okay, look, here, here's my example why you are wrong in your view of um, the, 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 the wave function. Um, take a system. Okay? And he says, um, the system be a, a substance in a chemically metastable equilibrium. 
um, for example, a chunk of gunpowder that can inflame itself via inner forces. Yeah? Where the average lifetime is uh, on the order of a year. Uh, in principle, um, this can easily describe quantum mechanics. In the beginning, the Psi function characterizes a sufficiently well-defined macroscopic state. Yeah? Chunk of gunpowder, not exploded. Just put that in your cat. And <coughs> your equation, he writes to Schrödinger, yeah? your equation, however, uh, takes care that after a year or so, this is not any longer the case. The Psi function then describes a sort of mixture between not yet exploded and already exploded system. A sort of mixture. Okay. By no art of interpretation can this Psi function be made an adequate description of the real factual situation. Because in reality, in Wahrheit, in reality, there is no such thing between, between being exploded and not yet exploded. Okay? So this was August 35, and then, of course, we all know later on, um, basically, um, this is just another way of saying exactly um, what, we, what we heard here in the letter. Yeah. And actually, I really would have liked to see the combination you know, of the chunk of gunpowder with the cat. <laughs> right? So there's not just sure, sure a thing between a cat being exploded and not yet exploded. <laughs> is this your cat? No, 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 I just found it in the <laughs> And then of course, so this you have here you have the this is, my, this is the quantum optics version of the of the Schrödinger cat. Okay, so basically um, this sort of mixture, of course, as we know today, just means that you create an entangled state between your um, between your or in, in this case superposition or in, in Schrödinger's case um, entangled state between the microscopic system and the cat being alive and uh, and, and another state of the microscopic system and the cat not being so well anymore. Um, now, and this has motivated, of course, um, many, many uh, experiments later on, and many, many discussions, obviously. But the main point, by the way, from Schrödinger's side was really, um, he called it a burlesque, burlesque situation. So for him, the, the reason why he put out this example of Schrödinger's cat was to ridicule the consequences of quantum mechanics. Okay? So um, for him, it was to say, look, there's obviously something going wrong when you go to large systems. Uh, there are a couple of other papers um, in the philosophical transactions um, and so on where he also uh, goes in this direction. And if you, read, if you read those papers in the philosophical transactions, actually he was so close, so close to discovering Ben's theorem. And there's just one little step um, that, that, that was missing. So, very fast. <laughs> so, these questions were all out there, right? And obviously, it's an exciting uh, from. From an, experiment, from an experimental point of view, it's an exciting question to ask. Well, um, what prevents us from okay, not <laughs> doing these experiments, but what prevents us from doing um, experiments where we really try to generate superposition states of um, uh, superpositions of macroscopically distinct states? Because that's this is where our everyday intuition fails. Right? That we have states of which we are. Uh, convinced that these are macroscopically distinct. I mean, it, uh, it can only be in this or in this uh, state in a macroscopic world. So creating a superposition of such macroscopically distinct states is the challenge that is um, that, that, that um, is underlying the Schrödinger cat. So here are a couple of um, examples, um, and I think that the history shows that the next um, the next 70 years there's just this myriad of incredibly beautiful experiments going to larger and larger systems. So just give you a couple of um, examples. So here, for example, uh, here in 2000, there were two papers, one by Rabbi Hans um, Moy and um, here in the Lukens group, uh, that uh, demonstrated superposition of a macroscopic current state. So uh, basically having 10 to the 6 um, electrons um, uh, in the superposition of um, co uh, uh, clockwise and counterclockwise propagating in a um, in a in a, in a, in a, a superconducting group. Then uh, Clement already mentioned this beautiful experiments um, of the Tolzi group, where you um, generate entanglement of a collective spin degree of freedom in a 
um, in an atomic <coughs> song, the forbidium atoms, Decker's with 10 to the 12 atoms. Um, other beautiful experiments, so here this is my colleague Markus Arndt um, in, the, in Vienna. He does this um, wonderful um, matter wave um, uh, interferometer experiments with macromolecules. Right? So it, um, you basically have a um, source of free flying molecules, you expose them to a double slit or to a grating, and then you observe um, interference patterns um, in, the, um, in the diffraction plane of these, of these gratings. And so, for example, here the, the, the world record that they have so right now. This is a well thing, a macromolecule that I never will be able to pronounce, but it consists out of 810 atoms, so um, approximately 10 to the 4 AMUs. And the the, the slit distance and the, yeah, the slit separation of the grating is in the order of 250 nanometers, um, and the object itself is only five nanometers. Okay? So that means that. Uh, you basically created a coherent superposition of the macromolecule literally being here and there. Okay? This is really an amazing result. Um, then we have uh, mechanical systems in the quantum machine. So this is this beautiful experiment by um, uh, Andrew Cleland, where they looked at the thickness oscillations of this piezoelectric aluminum nitride um, uh, plate. Uh, and couple it to a superconducting qubit. And what they demonstrated was Ramsey interference. <coughs> so they basically, um, they basically transferred a, a, an electronic superposition state um, on the mechanical uh, vibration state, and then they demonstrated coherence by uh, basically doing an interferometer. Um, in that case, the number of atoms involved so in the order of 10 to the 13. Right? Instead of having 1,000 atoms now, you have uh, the 10 to the 3 atoms, you have 10 to the 13 atoms. You jump 10 orders of magnitude. Okay? The separation, however, so if you ask, okay, what is the extent of our um, superposition in, in, in space? See, the separation is on the order of 10 to the minus 16 meter, 10 to the femtometer. So that means you have a superposition of your atoms in the little nitride being here, and there. Yeah. Nevertheless, you do see Ramsey interference. So this is actually a proof for coherence. However, you wouldn't call it a macroscopically distinct state, yeah, because the atoms are just near there. What you really would like to have is like your, your resonator being here and <laughs> over there. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, the, so the message here, um, there seems to be a trade-off yeah, in current experiments. Trade-off between um, mass on the one hand side and size of the superposition on the other side. Okay? So you can choose either you do like a meta wave um, experiment uh, with, um, with, with, with uh, say atomic scale uh, um, um, atom clouds, where you benefit from the fact that you have a free falling uh, system that doesn't interact with the environment and therefore can achieve very long coherence times and therefore very long coherence length because you can, only, you can let it expand right, and then hit a double slit or so. Um, or having a very massive system that strongly couples to its environment because that's the way we right now deal with massive systems. And then uh, you are very, very constrained in the coherence times and therefore length that you can achieve. Yeah? Um, and then of course if you go to the single atom um, the regime that is beautiful experiments by Sam Werner, Helmut Blau, the neutron interferometry. I mean, they have a single neutron that you separate by centimeters. Okay. And then, of course, all the modern experiments where I come to that. Um, actually, no. Oh, yeah. And here, just another uh, great example. Um, why is that actually? Yeah, exactly. Um, another great example um, Ernst Rasel in, uh, in, in Hanover. They have this incredible experiment where they put a BEC apparatus, and actually it's a BEC now, it's, now it's a really a BEC uh, interferometer. <coughs> they put it on a platform like that, okay? So this is like this size, okay? It's a whole BEC apparatus, right? And then they mount it into a capsule um, that they then put on a drop tower. Right? Here you have a, a 100 meter drop tower. Um, and then they just <laughs> let go and they drop it. 
Okay? Yeah, it sounds like fun. <laughs> so it is. Uh, and within this whole fall time, uh, so it, um, uh, within this uh, six second fall time, they actually manage um, to establish um, mods, create a PC, make atom interferometry, and then do an imaging of the interference pattern. Okay, and then it makes <laughs> uh, But there's some. Um, when, when, when you get, uh, how, how do you call it, these little styro of. Um, um, packing peanuts? Uh, this packing peanuts, exactly, right? They have like a pool of packing peanuts where the thing just goes in and then <laughs> survives. So they have actually demonstrated, I think up to now they already have like a hundred or so drops with this, with this effort. Which is amazing. It is really just amazing. So what's the, what's the point? <laughs> oh, uh, microgravity. So um, the idea eventually is... Hmm? Um, the idea eventually is to build an experiment where you uh, test the equivalence principle um, with, um, uh, with, with matter waves. So you basically have a double species um, uh, atom interferometer and you look for tiny uh, differential shifts in the interference pattern. And the absence of that provides you a bound to um, the equivalence principle, to the, to the accuracy of the equivalence principle. And of course, in order to do that, you need extremely um, long fall times and you need to go to space. So basically, the whole idea is um, to have a dedicated satellite on which you have this double speed, this, this dual species uh, interferometer, and then operate at zero gravity. Okay? And these are necessary tests that have to be done in order to um, get the money to put this thing then on a satellite. So is, is this, uh, the fact that it's a BC, is that, does that make it better than the other fountains? Except for the fact that you drop it, that's fun, but uh, like to test the same for the sensitivity, also the atom and the probability, right? Without making the BC to shoot them up and... Yeah, yeah I, I cannot answer this question. I don't know what the... But we would have to compare the sensitivity levels. Um, Actually, yeah, okay. um, so, so much for the, um, so much for the, the, the microscopic quantum experiments. On the other hand, uh, I'd say on the, on the other, on the other end of the, of the spectrum, we have uh, all those fantastic um, experiments that demonstrate that gravity works. In, in a way, uh, these tests of quantum physics or the quantum superposition principle on macroscopic scales of natural systems is just a wonderful test of the validity of quantum theory in different parameter regimes. Um, same for GR. So GR is a theory that has been tested to an amazing accuracy um, on different length scales, uh, time scales, and so on. So uh, one of the most, I would say, dramatic um, uh, confirmations of um, the GR was to look at the dynamics of binary pulses and see the energy dissipation um, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the revolution of those, of those systems. Um, now there are new systems, standard triple systems, and so popping up, so um, there will be even stronger evidence piling up, but the point is, really, uh, even in the presence of strong relativistic fields, um, strong gravitational fields, um, GR just con is confirmed to an amazing accuracy. Okay. Um, what is the period strong time? What is the what? The y-axis on your, like, I was just wondering if it is a number of Yes, it Okay, yeah, this is uh, periastron time. Uh -huh. um, I, I also always need to look that up. So this is a certain, um, actually, if you, have a, if you have a double star system, then actually there are different planes that you can, that you can um, define. Right? Um, and, and, and it's essentially the revolution time in this specific plane. So there's, 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 there's some names and, um, yeah. 
So you can think of it as a parameter of how far they are or how much energy the system has. All of those can be the bias. Okay. And of course, another in strong fields, or in weak gravitation fields, GR is confirmed um, uh, wonderfully. Uh, so you have tabletop <coughs> experiments, for example, at the University of Washington, so Jens Gundlach and, and others, they have this beautiful uh, um, uh, um, earth or cavendish type experiments with aluminum um, kilogram size test masses where they um, measure with high precision <coughs> gravitational constant, where they measure with high precision validity. Um, of the um, equivalence principle and so on. But on the other hand, of course, you can just use quantum systems like very high accuracy clocks and uh, measure the gravitational redshift. So the accuracy at that time, back in 2010, when uh, this experiment was done in the finance group, the accuracy was such that you could measure the difference in a 30 centimeter uh, height lift of, the, um, of a, an optical clock. And you can, you, can, you can see that the, the, the frequency shifts according to GR predictions through a gravitational match. I mean, nowadays, um, we have gained uh, already more than one order of magnitude better sensitivity. So it means in the future, if you want to have synchronized clocks or so, um, the accuracy that we are getting to is now really, uh, you will have to give your uh, 3D coordinates. Um, and you will need to know the um, actually uh, Earth's gravitational potential in order to make meaningful synchronization of clocks in the in the near future. Okay, so let me sum that up. Uh, this is sort of the plot that I already showed in the very beginning as a motivation slide, which has added now a few figures. And uh, but now now everything makes sense. I think so. I showed you um, if you plot coherence time versus mass, we have here these beautiful matter wave experiments. Um, that I showed to you, uh, be it cold atoms, be it macromolecules, um, and they have this amazing long coherence times because it's just molecular beam, more or less, be flying. Um, <clears throat> but they are sort of bound to, let's say, the ten, right now 10 to the 6 atoms, they might go up to 10 to the 10 atoms, but simply we, don't know, we do not know how to extend the methodology that exists to masses beyond that. Yeah, we simply, simply there, there is nothing, at least nothing that I am aware of, which doesn't mean that much, but uh, at least no one so far when they made this claim jumped up in the audience and said, oh, that's not true, I know how to do it. Okay? So, so far it's, the, um, it's a uncontradicted statement <laughs> that we simply don't know how to get there to larger classes. On the other hand, here we have the, the mechanical um, devices, um, mechanical um, degrees of freedom, where we significantly jump in mass, but the, the, coher but the coherence time simply sucks. Okay. Gravity, um, the experiments that have been done so far, I also made a statement already, um, the, the smallest source mass in the gravity experiment so far is in the order of 100, milli 100 milligram, uh, so close to, a, close to a kilogram. And most experiments are actually um, somewhere with tens of kilograms of the mass of the Earth. Now, remember that Feynman experiment that I was saying that we, we, take our, we take our 500 micron lead sphere, put it in a superposition uh, with a separation of the center of mass of 500 nanometers, and um, then start to let it gravitationally couple. So this point would be somewhere here. <laughs> okay? So we need, we need some very long coherence time in order to get the to, 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 to see the effects of gravitational coupling. Um, and we need um, a very large mass. Okay, um, so let me summarize. The challenge that we have is we want to achieve large mass and large uh, and long coherence times. The trade off that we have, we know solid state mechanical quantum devices give you the large mass. I think this is, for me personally, this is the, the biggest advance that has been put forward through all this optomechanics, electromechanics, it's all mechanical and quantum devices. Right? That, we have, that we now know um, how to go into regime of large mass in the quantum regime. Uh, however, coherence times suck. Um, in the matter wave case, matter wave interferometry, so free fall atoms, molecular beams, and so on, we have this incredible long coherence times, but small number of atoms. So, what do we do? Well, let's just combine the two techniques. Okay? 
Um, this is something that uh, people like um, uh, uh, people like um, Peter Zolder, Ignacy Silvak, and others um, have been putting forward already since some time. Uh, but now we at some point should take it also seriously. Now let, let's let's combine it. Okay. So what about quantum controlling levitated devices? Um, the advantage is. Um, First of all, we know how to how to do that with extremely uh, large number of atoms. I showed you the, um, our, our experiments where we basically have um, a sphere and couple it to the field of an optical cavity, and therefore we get um, all the nice possibilities of ground scale cooling and so on. And you know, once you have used the trap to ground state cool your system, so to prepare a pure state wave packet of an object, so of the of the degree of freedom. Uh, of the center of mass degree of freedom of an object with um, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 15, and so on atoms, you just switch off the trap. Okay? What happens then? Okay, free evolution. Okay, if you have free evolution, you can certainly uh, you, you can you can suddenly benefit from what you had in in, 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 in atom interferometry. Right? So you get this non coherence times then through free for them dynamics. Um, plus the exceptional force sensitivity, I already told you, and this is why coupling of gravity seems possible. So maybe just a, um, a note on the side. Um, he, there, there are a couple of beautiful papers where that demonstrate, uh, the theory papers, where these long coherence times are sort of calculated, really rigorous calculations, and I think one of the, um, one of the best papers out there um, for rigorous calculations of coherence times is the one by Oriol Romero uh, Sart. So it's a uh, professor of A from 2011, and he really does a full blown analysis of um, if you create um, in a harmonic trap through optomechanical interactions, for example, a pure state wave packet, so then, if, then it's actually um, you get a Gaussian uh, wave packet uh, with, a, with a width that is given by the ground state. Uh, size of the harmonic oscillator, um, where the mass and the frequency of your trap uh, enters, and um, then you just make free fall the dynamics. Okay? And then you ask the question, okay, so um, for how long does it stay coherent? Okay? And so what you look at, um, obviously, is basically position correlations. Um, and so uh, what you uh, decoherence theory, uh, uh, so decoherence would mean that you have a loss of position correlations. And um, what you do is now you just study all the possible influences, physical influences on your system that would give rise to these um, uh, to, to decoherence, okay? so the loss of position correlations. And uh, so, for example, background gas, right? just scattering. So this was, I think, one of the very first papers by by, by C. There's a this famous paper by Jose and C, uh, where they study actually decoherence of a system. Um, uh, for quantum system is in superposition when it's when, when you have some gas molecules scattering from it. Okay? So you can do that analysis. And you can see well if your background um, so what, what is the point by the way in, the, in this um, so if you have a superposition of the size, okay? Um, so the superposition of the atom uh, of the of the sphere being here and here, if a molecule, just a gas molecule, now hits the sphere, you immediately localize the thing. Okay, I mean, if, you're, if the coherence length um, of your molecule is small compared to the distance of your, of your separation of your, of your two states, then the information you get from a single scattering uh, event um, is maximum. Right? You can immediately from a single scattering event say if it was here or here, and that's why um, you immediately localize it. Okay? If the coherence length is long um, compared to the separation of your two possible macroscopic states, then um, you can only get partial information. Okay? And um, that's why the coherence rates usually scale with the distance, um, so with the size of your superposition, as long as your um, information gathering uh, physical system has a coherence length that is larger than the separation. And this, all, this is really standard decoherence uh, theory, um, and one could give a whole lecture. But anyways, if you put numbers, you can see if you go down to um, pressures at around 10 to the minus 10, 11 or so millibars, um, that you are already um, on a safe side um, for a 50 nanometer size particle. Okay. If you go to larger particles, you need to reduce the pressure further. But um, I mean, there are methods you can 
add some cryo um, pumping and so on to get to get to decent um, vacuum. Then. So vacuum is not a problem. Um, what can be a problem? Couples to a background uh, of a certain temperature. Right? So basically you have, um, let's say, you are the particle, or you are the sphere sitting in a vacuum chamber, you see the balls of the vacuum chamber, they are at a certain temperature, so you see all the black body photons um, from, your, from, from the walls of your vacuum chamber. They get scattered, they get absorbed, um, you, equilib you, um, you, will uh, you, you, you will you will get into thermal equilibrium, equilibrise, I have no idea how this <laughs> so you will get into thermal equilibrium, um, and you also emit uh, photons. Right? And um, the, the, the point is now, um, and here normally it is said that, oh, now if the, if the photon that is emitted, that's the same argument that I gave before, if the wavelength of the photon that is emitted is smaller than the size of the superposition, then you immediately localize the thing. That is correct. However, it's also the quantity of the photons. So even if you have a very long wavelength photon, such that an individual photon does not give any provide any information of whether that it was emitted from here or from here. If you do have many photons, statistics just kills you. Right? So because the, 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 um, you will get a very well defined diffraction pattern in your observational plane with a very well defined center of mass of the diffraction pattern if you if you have many many photons. Right? So if if the object is hot, it's not the, the short wavelength photons that kill you, which is the amount of long wavelength. Anyway, so you can do all these calculations, and here, um, and, and Oriol did that to perfection, really. It's a beautiful paper, um, where he also reviews all the theory, the theory and so on. And uh, here's an example. He takes a 15 nanometer um, sphere and um, cranks up now, um, the, or it reduces the temperature of the environment. Yeah. And uh, so at the end, it's really it's a scattering of black body photons from the environment that uh, are the dominant source for localization. Um, and here in that example you can see that um, if you go down to like 100 Kelvin or so, you're already um, at some tens of milliseconds. If you go even further down to like, what's that, it's linear, 90, 80, 70 Kelvin. At 70 Kelvin you're already somewhere at half a second. Right? So um, you can get, even for a large object, like a, like a 50 nanometer sphere, you can get with reasonable temperatures into a regime where you get long coherence. That's the message. So, that is why I claimed previously, in the very first lecture, that we can actually do that. That by looking to le into levitated systems, we can both on the quantum side increase the mass for long coherence times. And at the same time, through the experiment that I showed you yesterday, or the experimental proposal, um, get into a regime where we will be sensitive to um, small gravitational source points. Okay. There was a black body calculation. The, this last one was a black body calculation. But again, go to the paper. This is a um, beautiful summary of all the possibility to hear mechanisms. Yeah. And now this ties in now, of course. Um, to all these beautiful other experiments that uh, want to investigate the interface between quantum physics and gravity. Right? This is actually this is where, where everything that I'm um, saying and piling up to is heading towards. Okay? It's the fact that we can come, make these two uh, regimes come closer, can we uh, actually um, use that to make statements or experiments um, with some new information content on the interface between quantum physics and gravity. And again, uh, I always want to also uh, beat the historical drum. You should always read what others have done. Um, there are so amazingly beautiful experiments out there um, uh, on this on this interface between quantum physics and gravity. So this is my favorite one. This is the famous cow experiment after the initials of Kolela, Oberhauser, and Werner. Right? Um, so what they did is they had a neutral interferometer and uh, they actually rotated it in the gravitational field of the Earth. Yeah, and well, so this is sort of the, the DC uh, Harn of Bohm um, effect, so the electric Harn of Bohm effect. Right? They basically have a, a dynamic phase um, because um, if, 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 if this is the gravitation field, this is the interferometer, um, you accumulate different phases uh, because you see different potentials um, of, your, of your gravitational um, field. And this is what we, what we discussed yesterday. 
Um, and so they rotated in the gradational field and then got this beautiful interference fringe. So this is really um, a gravitation induced interference fringes um, by looking what happens to a um, quantum system that um, traverses in a classical gravitational field. Right? In that sense, it's super trivial quantum physics. You have, um, you, have a, you, have, you, you take a, you take the center of mass motion of a quantum system, shooting equation, you add a classical field to it. Of course, you know what happens. Right? Um, and, uh, but it's gravity. This is the very first experiment um, for which you actually required a combination of H and little g, um, so Earth's, um, Earth's uh, gravitational um, uh, um, uh, acceleration, to, to, to be able to describe it. Right? And if you want, you can say, oh, it's H by capital G, right? Because little g is just capital G divided by the uh, radius of the Earth. Right? <laughs> Multiplied by mass of the Earth divided by the rate of the Earth. Mm. And then, of course, uh, there are all these other beautiful experiments. So, the atomic fountain experiments, pioneered by Kasevich, Chu, and so on. Right? They measure, uh, they, they are sensitive to the gradient of the gravitational field. Right? Um, other example, uh, gravitationally bound states of neutrons. This is just an amazing work. You take a neutron, you let it fall, and then you, you prepare. Uh, perfectly reflecting surface, and then you have two potentials. You have the potential of your, of your wall here, so it's back reflected, and you have the potential of um, Earth's gravitational field. And um, what you create now uh, is essentially such a, a triangular uh, a potential, um, and in which you get uh, discretized energy eigenstates of the system. And, and um, so this is, this is now a potential that is made up by the, uh, by the gravitational field of the Earth, and um, the, 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 the energy eigenstates of that system um, are simply gravitationally bound states of these neutrons. And then you can do, um, so actually Hartmut Abele in Vienna um, has now been starting to do beautiful spectroscopy um, uh, experiments on these energy eigenstates. Okay, well, and sort of just to conclude now this, uh, this part, uh, I showed you that, that already yesterday. Okay. Um, and now you can now you can really start asking, okay, where, where do we stand? I mean, um, what is the reason that we want to do um, experiments at the interface between quantum physics and gravity? Because the concepts simply um, do not line up. Right? There's a mismatch um, in the concepts. We don't know how a system in a superposition gravitates because we do not know how time flows um, in such a in such a in such a universe. You take a universe without everything in it, just a single particle, and you push that in a superposition, uh, we simply don't know how to describe space-time in that case. Right? That is exactly the, the, the challenge of a um, uh, quantum theory of gravity. And then I, I gave you all the examples um, uh, yesterday of the possible answers um, that you could say, um, well, um, we know how to do it. It's, just, it's eventually solved. It's just mathematically hard. But you just do quantum field theory uh, with lots of um, uh, with, with lots of um, mathematical vigor, and um, you will get uh, consequences, the coherence, but it's super super weak and might not be explored experimentally. Um, there are others that say, well, you have to do it correct, <laughs> um, and if you do that, then you get strong decoherence. And again, others that say, oh no no. Um, space-time is fundamentally different from the, so the gravitational field is fundamentally different from the electromagnetic field. That's why you're not allowed to, uh, to touch it. Um, and um, you do get, as a consequence, then strong decoherence. And other modifications in the dynamics that I don't tell you about. But so, that for, yeah. Uh, the experiments that you talked about, right, talking about how classical gravity has an effect on quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so what are you saying about quantum gravity? Yeah, I can't do that. Mm. Um, so far, nothing. <laughs> there's, there's no experiment out there that would say something. Um, so, from an experimental point of view, it seems, um, so what, where, where all these uh, different approaches agree at, is that there should be some level of decoherence. Right? From unobservable to observable. And I just say that now from knowing what the numbers are in these, uh, in these different papers that are out there, okay? Um, so that means um, that uh, 
it might be interesting if you do macroscopic uh, experiments um, to start looking at the coherence in these experiments uh, and, then, and then see um, what does quantum theory tell you because there is some um, simple uh, uh, canonical decoherence due to coupling to the environment and then there might be some extra decoherence on top and then well if you see strong decoherence maybe you just have to do clever experiments to de distinguish those effects. So do the except for the, for the fact that weak and strong do they scale differently with? Yes different? and they also scale differently. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. They scale differently. Well for that one actually we don't know yet because this is more conjecture than a actual um, proof right now. Mm. Um, and one thing I actually did not mention, I, I, should, say, I, should, I should say that, um, so in all of these experiments, so the experiments that exist so far at the interface between quantum physics and gravity, um, we had a quantum particle Sort of as a, we use a, a quantum particle sort of as a test mass in an external gravitational field. Okay, so this is one way of simply uh, understanding uh, how, uh, what, what these experiments do. Um, where I would like to go right, with, these, um, with these levitated systems, I would like to take the next step. I would like to do quantum experiments on a system that by itself actually acts as a source mass for a gravitational field. Yeah. It's got to be really tiny. <laughs> tiny? Oh yeah, right, that's gravity tiny. Well, that's just what I said before. Yeah, yeah. 500 micrometer. Yeah. 500 micrometer will already create a gravitation field that one can in principle. Yeah. But the point is, um, good that you say that. Um, in, on this side of things, okay? So on the side of things that um, go, I would say, beyond what is currently conventional quantum field theory approaches to gravity. Um, there's, there seems to be a, um, uh, there seems to emerge a sort of consensus in the predictions that once you reach the 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 atom level, you do get effects that, um, uh, uh, that are strong enough that you could observe it. Okay. Although that the field is very weak, the consequences of putting uh, uh, actually, the gravitational energy into all those equations seem to be strong enough. Because it's not a lot of atoms that to the toilet. No, it's not. Yeah, but that's 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 what I find so amazing. But on the other hand, but, but then again, so this brings me back to my uh, falsification statement of yesterday. That might also just tell you that uh, there's something fundamentally wrong on this left side. <coughs> okay. But if you take the left side serious, then it seems that so far all the approaches that I saw. Once you reach the 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 atom level, you start to, 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 to get predictions that are not anymore totally inconsistent with what you can get in could you get with what you could get in an experiment. Which is I which I find really amazing. And it's it's completely different approaches. So that is, is is it a statement of the fact that 10 to the 12 atoms put enough curvature in space time to be observable? Is that the same statement or the different statement? Because I find that hard to believe. Mm. Yeah. No, I, well, you know, curvature is just the geometric interpretation of right, what's right. going on. So, um, but, no, in, in, yeah, I mean, look, um, if you take Penrose's case, yeah, it's a pure conjecture. Right. Right? It's just um, if the gravitational energy difference is on the order of one graviton, then you have to see the coherence. Right? And so if you put the numbers that's varied up with then with 10 to 12, 10 to 13 atoms. Yeah. Purely conjecture. Well, all of them. Mm -hmm. That's it? Yeah. So, experimentally, so one possible approach is to basically start looking at the coherence. Okay? Build experiments that basically um, uh, 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 investigate the coherence. Which points down to the old question, of course, in the microscopic experiments. At the end of the day, you know, uh, if you have cats at home or dogs at home, uh, they are only in one macroscopic state. So the question is, how did it end up in this one macroscopic state and not in an entangled state? Right? So this is the typical question who actually killed Schrodinger's cat? 
right? So was it um, Miss Peacock? So I mean, standard quantum physics, right? Like just the coherence, coupling to the environment, and so on. Or Kern Mustard, is there some new physics going on? Okay. Um, of course, if you want to do these decoherence experiments, uh, you need to be extremely careful in analyzing experiments. You, you need to know where does your um, um, where decoherence could come from, originates from, and so on. And again, I just referred to this um, to the paper by Oriol, um, who basically did a beautiful analysis of that. Uh, at the end, it more or less boils down to um, uh, um, uh, open quantum system dynamics. Okay? So basically, um, you need to know um, how your system interacts, um, what is the um, what, what are the relevant couplings, and so on. And at the end of the day, you will get an open system. You get some uh, Eulian, and then uh, that uh, can have different origins. It can be due to gas scattering, for example, and then you can directly calculate what the decoherence rates are compared with the experiments. But it could also be due to such strange um, uh, 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 conjectured alternative models to quantum theory where um, gravity is assumed to play a role. And this is then gravitationally induced decoherence um, due to some mechanism that is really new physics. Okay? This is all conjectures, but I have to very, very uh, uh, brutally say that. The nice thing is, and this is something I, uh, I really uh, here the credit goes to Oriol for pointing it out, that all of those alternative models can be cast into such an open system um, approach, which is very nice because you can directly use all the analysis and uh, basically have now um, the full scaling, okay, and this is the point, um, of those additional decoherence terms that pop up. Okay? Uh, just to give you one example, so we, um, we, we, we looked at um, Cleland's experiment, and we're asking the question, oh, now, if you have the superposition of your 10 to the 13 atoms being here and displaced by 10 to the minus 16 meters, um, is that superposition already large enough to rule out um, the assumptions of Penrose? Okay. Uh, so the idea would be, um, with, with this uh, um, Penrose's model, that essentially says you cannot have a superposition of two center of mass uh, uh, um, uh, two center of mass points of a massive system. Um, if you try to create that, you get a certain decoherence. And the farther you put them apart, the stronger is the decoherence. So that means Penrose predicts that um, Penrose predicts a certain uh, decoherence time in the system that scales now with mass and separation. Okay, so you can just put in um, the mass and separation you you, you have um, here in this experiment right, and compare it to the predictions by Penrose. And now comes something that actually Keith also pointed out, I think, yesterday, um, that the Penrose model is super zooming gum. Right? This is like um, many models have that uh, features that you can um, that you can very freely uh, um, change uh, some parameters in order to get every prediction from 10 femtoseconds to the lifetime of the universe. Um, which is not fully true. I mean, um, in, in the Penrose case, there's a, there's a very clear upper bound, but there's also but there's no lower bound. So the point is, um, in order to be able to make predictions about the consequences of a superposition of gravitational fields, you have to assume how the mass is distributed. Okay? So here is your sphere. Yeah? So how is the mass distributed in the sphere? Well, you would say this is just a um, sphere um, with a homogeneously distributed uh, um, stuff. <laughs> right? So basically, it's just continuous. Uh, the mass distribution is just um, um, inside here. It's homogeneous, and then it's just bound. That's it. You could also say, oh, wait a minute. This sphere consists of atoms. Right? But atoms are like little spheres in space with nothing in between. Okay? So the real mass distribution is actually a sum of delta peaks, a little tiny peaks. Okay? So if you cut through and make a plot of the mass density, then it's just all these spikes. Okay? Also a possibility. Um, or you could say, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, but, the, but, but the nucleus, actually, yeah? 
What about that one? Uh, isn't there also something in there? Uh, and so on and so on. Uh, we can, we can, so this is what I mean by chewing gum. You, 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 you bridge all the, all the, the, the length scale from 10 to the minus uh, 15 meter, or maybe even below 10 to the minus 20 meter, up to the millimeter scale. Okay? Um, and the point of the prediction uh, in, in the Prendor's case is that, uh, let's say, these are the two center of mass positions of your, of your, of your object. Um, at the moment, the two don't overlap anymore. You get huge decoherence. Okay? So now, um, if I take my sphere, right, and say the mass distribution is homogeneous over the sphere, I need to separate. I may need to make a separation that is on the order of the size of the sphere in order to get a significant decoherence rate. Right? So the separation of my two states needs to be in the order of the, of the diameter of the, of the sphere. Okay? Well, um, of, my, of my object here. As I said before, um, this thing here is 250 nanometers. The size of the separation was uh, 10 to the minus 16. Um, so uh, basically, um, there is no separation. Okay? So you basically, the Pendulus wouldn't predict anything. Well, let's say co decoherence times on the order of I don't know, years. But wait a minute. Um, what if the mass is distributed um, within just little spheres that sit in my object? Right? Then a tiny displacement is already enough uh, to separate it from. Okay? And so, so that, that was what we did. We basically modeled. Uh, we said, okay, this is a single crystal, and we put, uh, we put uh, at the location of each atom, we put a sphere and put all the mass in the sphere. Um, and the radius of the sphere is our, is our free parameter, our, our fitting parameter. And then the question is, to what size do I have to confine the mass such that the Penrose model would predict a decoherence that is larger than the one that was observed in this experiment? Because that means that I can rule out the Penrose model um, for all values of mass confinement that are smaller than that. Okay? So we did that. The numbers are not uh, really uh, impressive, but the point is you do get, of course, an excluded region. So here's the, the, ra the radius, so the size of this, of this mass distribution confinement as a function of uh, coherence time. Um, this is the actual uh, value that was seen in the experiment, and so you can exclude this tiny region. Okay? But still, you can already exclude something. You can say that actually the mass has to be uh, confined to a radius larger than 10 to the minus 21 meter in order to be consistent with the Penrose model. Okay? That's physically not yet uh, really relevant, but the message is um, you can exclude something, and now in order to go up here and exclude larger and larger regions, well, you have to push up the coherence time. Okay? Maybe, maybe not in this specific system, because as you can see here, this is actually um, third each. This is a logarithmic, logarithmic tail with 13 orders of magnitude for each. Um. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is so this is one uh, one position. So what does Penrose say? Because I, I was at this you were at this meeting as I told you it was it was mm -hmm. not clear what he mm -hmm. says, right? Okay. Depends on the time of day you ask. Right. <laughs> no seriously. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. But of course, there's a, the point is, as I said, there's an upper bound with a definite answer. The upper bound is that make a separation that is right. as large. Oh, no, no. The, um, um, assume a, a mass distribution that is um, homogeneous over the extent of the object. Right. Right. So in that case, actually, um, the R, once the R hits the 250 nanometers, so 10 to the minus 7, okay, then you actually should um, you see something. Well, it's 20, so 10 to the 7 would be here somewhere. Yeah, and then you would see something. Like mm. So I think this is, the, this is the ultimate bound, and once you rule out that, then it's there. Yeah. Um, so, what are the other possibilities to create now um, larger um, uh, superposition states? Okay, so this is a, again, here they are confined to 10 to the 16 meter, this might not be the way to go. So what about, what about larger separation? So here's one possibility. That's something that, um, uh, again, Oriol and Romero Sartre, um, uh, together with Michael, put out a couple of years ago. It's just a, like, like fooling around with the possibilities of theory. Okay? Uh, possibility of an experiment is, is on another, <laughs> another scale. Uh, so um, idea, again, 
particle levitated in a potential, do ground state cooling, um, and then free expansion, and then expose it to some sort of landscape. Okay, so this would be, would be the whole point. Do a double still experiment, so really meta wave nephromity um, by exploiting the fact that a long um, fall time gives you actually expansion. And therefore, you should be able then to create a macroscopic superposition uh, depending on how large you make this. Okay. And well, we, we proposed here a specific, um, a specific way of doing that, but uh, that's not really important. I think the, the, the more important point is now you can, and um, you, now you can look at um, what happens decoherence time as a function of size of the object. Right? And you see now the different scalings. You see that the decoherence is different uh, whether you are um, just quantum theory. So there, uh, for example, the decoherence scales with R squared because this is the scattering cross section for molecules for air molecules hitting it. Um, and Penders and Kalihasi make different predictions. So this is, this is the famous Girati Rimini Weber uh, predictions. And you see, um, you get a crossover at some point at a certain size of your, of your sphere where the uh, predicted uh, decoherence rate is larger than what you expect from quantum okay. And so you can do some analysis. You can calculate actually the full uh, pattern, the full interference pattern, and uh, look at the different predictions for it. Can we go back to the previous? So the gamma is in hertz. Yeah. <coughs> so the third street is going to be a hard experiment. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. But yeah. yeah. Okay. No, it was just, it's not kilohertz. No, 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 no. This is exactly. So we are always, um, once we, one, this must be clear. When we are in this regime, we are talking about second time scales. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is something everyone has to be clear about. That. Right, right. This is second time scale. This is what makes it such a completely yeah. outrageous yeah. experiment. Yeah. So you're confused. This, this assumes a certain mass. Second. This assumes a certain mass of the sphere, or, or the mass of that particular matter. That's the radius of the sphere. Sorry. Okay. Um, so this assumes a certain density. So you crank up the mass. On the, on the right side, yeah, on the x-axis. That's great, that's right. Um, but again, <coughs> this, is, this is the vision part, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm just giving motivation why such experiments are interesting. Whether they can be done is a completely different, uh, <coughs> completely different page. I'm just saying it's worthwhile going in this direction. Right? And, and, then, and then maybe to see why we cannot reach seconds coherence times. That's also interesting. Right? But I think uh, as an experimental physicist, to me, the challenge is out there, the challenge is large mass, long coherence time. Let's just see how far we get. If we get in a regime that is significantly larger than what we have these days, um, and again, people have seen seconds, uh, tens of seconds with 10 to the 6 atoms. Uh, so this is not completely crazy. Um, then we can basically also test for those right. models. Right? I think that's the only message that I have. Uh, and then of course you can think, well, if you really need these long fall times and so on, um, then maybe you want to go to space. And this is something that um, we, we, we did together with Keith some time ago. Um, we looked at possibilities that one can build such an experiment, so levitate an object, do optomechanics, optomechanics, to go to the ground state, expand and so on, on a platform that could go on a satellite. So uh, basically we, we, we are collaborating there with <coughs> the German um, company that builds satellites and that has built and developed optical technology. And uh, basically, the, the reason why they did that was for the uh, LISA mission, so the gravitational wave in the from it and space. And they built this uh, so-called LISA technology package. They actually have, um, they have that here, you can see that. Um, um, they have uh, on board two large gold masses, so they are two gold cubes. Um, and what they do is they basically measure interferometrically the distance between the two gold cubes. It's sort of a, uh, and in the end of the day, um, those two gold cubes would be on completely different satellites and uh, like three million kilometers apart. Um, and you measure that, and this the, the test mission they want to do it on board of a single satellite. So in order to do that, they built actually um, they built uh, interferometers that go onto a uh, onto a, a bonded to a platform that can go into space. And um, here you can see, for example, the, the, the module. So this is a ULD uh, platform with optics bonded to it. Then everything is packaged and it can go into a satellite. 
and then this is how the whole thing looks like. Right? So this is the uh, already everything in there, and it's supposed to launch next year. Right? Uh, and the point was this thing can actually um, this thing can actually carry all. They have developed essentially already most of the technology that one would need for such experiments. And then the question is how to <laughs> just have to do it. So it's an additional string of big medium, or is it what you would do? It's an additional string of big medium, or is it piggybacking <coughs> the string of big medium? Nah, well, that would be, of course, nice if one could piggyback, but that's too late. I mean, this thing is already it's ready, right? it just sits there and waits to be launched. Uh -huh. So you would have to be Yeah, but actually, piggybacking is a good, good possibility. Okay, I'm completely over time, I'm sorry. I just want to mention one last thing. Okay, so this is already coherent stuff. But actually, um, uh, so this is one possibility. If you want to look at an interface, then uh, decoherence is one way to check it. But I also admittedly, um, I'm a less and less fan of, of doing it this way because I mean, well, decoherence is everywhere. It's just so super hard to distinguish lab-based decoherence from anything else. Right? Um, so. But it's still super exciting to do experiments, yeah? So, this is maybe something I should ask before, or maybe you mentioned. What would be the, the basic difference, if there is, or maybe it's too complicated, in a, of, of the mechanism of the coherence that distinguishes a quantum theory from a classical theory? Is there, or, or will you just measure a different time scale and you could say, okay, this theory doesn't work, that theory maybe works? Yeah. So uh, it's, it, it would really be um, the scaling with parameters, okay? So um, basically, uh, you see that uh, the decoherence uh, parameter scales um, uh, specifically with uh, the certain uh, power of the radius of the object, for example, therefore with the mass of the object. Right? So um, it, let's say you really see some sort of added decoherence in your experiment that you cannot explain. Um, then you should do two things. First of all, uh, try to convince other colleagues around the world to do similar experiments to get independent tests. And secondly, um, design experiments um, where, where you basically now uh, vary the parameters to such an extent that you can exclude a lead based decoherence. Okay. So I will do it. Okay, um, so now here comes the good thing of having the last talk in a conference. Um, you can go over time uh, without being apologetic. <laughs> okay, I just take, sorry, so I just take another five to ten minutes for a last topic that I um, go through. Um, namely, so decoherence was one thing, okay? So decoherence, um, oops, decoherence, where did I? There you go. So, um, decoherence was sort of, this is why I brought it up, because it shows up in each of those different approaches um, to, 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 to quantizing gravity. Um, on the other hand, you may ask now, well, um, might it be that there are other consequences um, of a quantum theory um, of gravity? And I give you an example that uh, comes from a completely different direction. So there are beautiful experiments out there where you test high energy physics in tabletop experiments. Here is one example is supersymmetry. Um, so there was uh, recently there was um, sort of the, the wrapping up a uh, would say two decade long um, an, an endeavor in experimental groups all around the world. So uh, Gabriel said. Uh, being one of them, and Heinz um, being another one of them, uh, to measure in a tabletop experiment bounds on the possible um, dipole, electric dipole moment um, of the electron. Okay? Um, so the sign on the cover had this, this question, how round, how round is the electron? Right? And the idea is super beautiful. I mean, if there would be a slight dipole moment, a light asymmetry, um, and then, then an electron that is confined in an atom or a molecule where there are strong electromagnetic fields would couple, so the dipole moment would couple to this electromagnetic field. And if you have a coupling inside your atom, you get some splitting. <laughs> right? So um, the, the coupling of your, uh, of your dipole moment uh, to the internal electromagnetic fields would immediately result into some, uh, into some splitting of some levels. 
Okay, I don't go into the details. But the point is, that means you can now build a spectroscopy experiment um, where you look actually for certain splittings or consequences of that possible splitting in your, um, in your, in your, in your atom. And that's what they did. So in, in that case, they had like thor um, um, thorium uh, um, oxygen molecules. Um, they, you see the apparatus, 20 centimeters. Um, they, they pumped into a certain spin state, an extra field, the precession, and so on. And basically looked for forbidden uh, um, states in the system. And they didn't find them, but the precision of the experiment gave them um, a bound on the possible size of the dipole moment. If the dipole moment would be larger, they would have seen it given the precision in the experiment. So why is that interesting? It's interesting because um, certain supersymmetric theories predict certain values for the electric dipole moment of the electron. So putting a bound on that gives a bound on those supersymmetry theories. And those are uh, theories that make predictions on the terra electron world scale. So that means these are, these, are, these are energy scales that you would look for in a uh, LHC experiment, for example, in some high energy scale experiment. But the, consec but, 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 uh, the point is that um, uh, what you can also do is you can, you can look for the consequences of those models in a tabletop experiment. And so they beautifully conclude here in this paper, uh, within the box of many models, our electric dipole moment limit constrains CP violation up to energy scales similar to or higher than those explored directly at the large hydrogen. Um, I actually made the mistake of pointing that out to one of our um, uh, uh, ministers, uh, uh, one of our deputies of the minister, um, who is actually directly in charge of funding the LHC oh. from the Austrian side. <laughs> 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 and he followed up with a couple of emails, oh, Byron, can you give me more information? <laughs> 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 Well, so, you know, sometimes emails just don't make it to your inbox and uh, they mysteriously disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, an obvious question to ask is now, of course, if we can do it on a terra electron world scale, what about quantum gravity? Can we also uh, now look for um, quantum theories of gravity that are actually on energy scales even larger, right? or, or, or Planck energy scales? Um, and can it, couldn't it be that they also make predictions that have consequences on the low energy scale? Okay. Uh, so here's an example that you might think of. Here's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, so basically, um, uh, the position variance versus momentum variance. The red line is that what you expect. Um, that the, the, the better you want to um, actually uh, confine your object in position, we have the fair price of momentum. Okay. Now, if you believe in quantum theory, which we all do, if you believe in GR, which we also all do, we know that momentum couples to space-time curvature. Okay? This is just an energy momentum tensor. So that means now, um, if you try to localize your particle more and more, the momentum uncertainty will create a larger and larger uncertainty in space-time curvature to the extent that you reach a point when operationally the concept of position doesn't make sense anymore. When you have a space-time that is bent into itself, um, it's meaningless to talk about position below this point. And this actually happens if you, if you do the numbers, do the calculations, and I forgot to put a reference, I will do that. Um, uh, this actually happens somewhere at the Planck length. And this is one operation definition of the plant um, Now the question is how to deal with that. There are different approaches. If you talk to Bob Walt, for example, a very famous um, general relativity person, um, then he says, oh yeah, that's correct. Um, the point is, uh, the solution to that is we simply don't know what happens. Okay? So it's like Vila's uh, uh, smoky dragon that just sits there. This is a region, if you go below, below the plant scale, below the plant length, we just don't know what happened. Another possible approach is to say, well, somehow everything still needs to stay analytical. Right? And that means that you simply have to modify now um, your, your Heisenberg uncertainty. Right? So it just means that you cannot go below that. So basically this thing is just bent over. Okay? And there are a couple of 
quantum fields of gravity out there to, that make that prediction. Okay? Um, some people like it, some people don't like it. So this is a, this is a feature of the gravitational wave community, uh, the, the, sorry, the, 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 the quantum gravity community. Um, you have more opinions out there than people working in the field. <laughs> So whenever you say, oh, this is what some people actually suggested, you can be sure that there are at least 10 other people who say, oh, that's the biggest bullshit that is around there. Yeah? And other than people say, yeah, exactly, that's the way to go. So this is a, an, it's an amazing community. So the, they, they just hate each other, a lot of them. So they, um, there's no, no communication, nothing whatsoever. Um, OK, now, question is, could you could it be that a modification of that, even if it's on a plant scale, has some consequences on the low energy scale that one could test in tabletop experiments? Yeah. And very surprisingly, and that's something that uh, we found out, so it was actually Igor Pikowski in Vienna, um, is that yes, you can find something right, in that for, for, for this specific example. And the idea um, goes back to trapped ion physics again. So in trapped ion physics, um, what, what you can do is, um, you can take your iron, you shuffle it around in phase space, okay, and make an x displacement, p displacement, and so on. You make a closed loop in phase space, and then you generate a geometric phase. So uh, the wave function of your um, of your iron gets an additional uh, global phase, and the phase is proportional to the area that you enclose. And there are some beautiful papers, so the theory was by, I think, by Richard Milburn some time ago, and then the experiment was done in, in, in the finance group in 2003. Um, now, let's do the following. Let's take our mechanical system, and let's make a loop in phase space. So let's displace it, x displacement, p displacement, minus x displacement, minus p displacement. Okay? So x, p, minus, minus p. Um, then our mechanical oscillator gets a global phase, and the global phase is proportional to the area. The area, if these are really true displacement operations, is just the canonical commutator, xp minus px. Okay, so basically you can show, you can show that if you do Baker and Hausdorff on the on, on, on the way you operate on that, and then uh, actually so this is a very um, expensive and, um, and and a difficult method to measure the canonical commutator, but to measure i. And of a mechanical system. Um, but of course, in order to read out this global phase, you would have to do some interference experiment. It's very hard. The iron guys can do that. We cannot do that so far. So, um, but what you can do is you can actually take an ancilla. So, uh, how do you shove this thing around in phase space when you hit it with a laser pulse, for example? Right? Um, so, you couple your mechanical system to an optical pulse or so, to an optical field that makes this operation here. And it turns out, that after you complete your full trip in phase space, round trip in phase space, your mechanical system is again in its own state, and the phase information that is inquired through the optomechanical coupling is also imprinted actually on the optical ancilla. So now you basically made out of that whole thing an optical problem, and now you can do quantum state tomography on your optical pulse uh, and retrieve the phase information. Okay, that's just um, a more simple way of, of measuring that. So when, um, when Igor showed that to us, and when we started to discuss, we, we asked the question, well, by the way, how sensitive is this method? We know that quantum optical uh, readout, we have quantum limited possibilities, measuring and so on. Might it be that actually the, 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 the sensitivity that you get is so, so good that you are able to pick up possible modifications to the commutator? Okay? So this was the question. And then Igor did, uh, uh, did, did all the calculations, so there are a couple of papers out there that derive how the commutator should be modified based on this modi modified Heisenberg uncertainty relation, and we just put that in our, in our model here. And the point is, so you, get, um, you start out with your pulse that you, that you use to do the displacement, then you get a certain, um, then you get that the commutator just shifts your phase, and then you get an additional added phase because of this modification in the community. And then we put numbers, which are completely, um, um, how do you say that, uh, uh, completely um, without thinking, <laughs> more or less. Um, so without thinking, we just put numbers, and the amazing, the amazing thing was, with relatively um, feasible numbers, in terms of an optomechanical system, so optical finesse on the order of 100,000, 
masses on the order of some uh, some tens of nanogram frequencies in the kilohertz to the hundreds of kilohertz regime. Um, uh, uh, yeah, you and, and sensitivities for optical detection we can achieve in the lab. You can bound the modification down to the plug -in. And this was really amazing. So in principle, it should be possible to do an experiment um, if you manage to do this displacement operation. So if you manage to really shuffle it around in phase space, like with xp minus x minus p displacements, it should be possible to do an experiment where you can test for, possible, for, for these specific modifications down to the plug scale. And therefore, provide a direct test of those um, of those predictions. Okay? Or let's let's put it in another way, um, similar to this EM experiment I showed you. The absence of such an additional phase shift, or let's say the error bars of our experiment, provide direct bounds for possible um, cons uh, for, for, for for the for the parameters in those modified uh, commutator theories. Okay? And this is I find super fascinating. So for me. Um, this means that actually there are possibilities out there that quantum theories of gravity can actually um, uh, make low energy scale predictions. This was just, we were lucky to find this one example, but I'm pretty sure that there are many, many examples out there. You just have to sit down and look into them. Okay? Um, so this is, my, this, is, this is my message from that. that um, this is one example. If this is the best example, I don't know, because these are also little artificially cooked theories. Um, but still, theories at this energy scale of the plug energy, and they do have low energy consequences. So I think this is a fascinating um, uh, perspective for future work in quantum gravity for tabletop um, experiments. And now what we are doing is actually uh, we, are, we, are, we are setting up an experiment to actually do such displacement operations. And I think now it's simply too long the time. I, mean, I can show you what we do, but um, maybe it's maybe we call it call it a day. And yes. Well, I mean, there's, there's higher order commutators that will also be affected if you change that basic one. If you do, like, squeezing, squeezing, and squeezing such that you get back to the original state, your net effect is a rotation called mm. the linear rotation. Mm -hmm. And that'll be changed. That operator there won't just be a mere rotation, yeah. it'll be something different okay. because of that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody, I mean, that's just the, net, the basic extension of what you're doing. No, yeah, so far, um, so far there are no extensions. So it would be super interesting to, to see that. What I would like to see is to go beyond those, um, those, those commutator relations. The underlying message is excellent quantum state control of massive systems, because that's what it is, allows you to become sensitive to modifications um, uh, um, that are uh, low energy scale that are predicted by high energy quantum field. I think this is a sort of general statement that I would like to make. Okay. And this is what we exploit here. The possibility that we can do this, um, uh, that we can do this uh, uh, displacement operations. So Q and D measurement, essentially. That's what we're working on right now. So I would say uh, I stop here. If you are interested in the, in the Q and D experiments that we're doing, um, just ask me. I put it up. It's going to be another five minutes. And otherwise, I just wrap up now for now. So conclusion number one. Uh, with respect to levitated massive systems, um, they are just super cool. <laughs> okay? um, right now, we are not in a quantum regime at all. Um, we, I, I showed you a little bit what we have with our, with our uh, optically cooled uh, particle down to, what, 50 Kelvin or so. Um, uh, I showed you our particle in the, in the fiber. Um, and we are just trying to push that really to high vacuum and into the quantum regime. Um, but once we are there, it's super cool because this really provides a completely new regime for Maxwell quantum physics. They call it extreme matter waves. Uh, it provides a completely new regime for gravitational quantum physics because you now can start um, uh, exploring the consequences of having a source mass characteristics of your quantum system. Uh, it provides you a completely new regime of gravitational sensing because you now can become sensitive to, um, a, to small gravitational fields of small objects. Um, and it might be interesting from the, from the application part, I don't know yet. That's, that's just a conjecture. Um, conclusion number two with respect to gravitation and quantum physics, that's my prediction for the next 20 years. Um, so levitated oscillators um, will provide um, a, new, a new route for, um, for, for, for these experiments. 
these experiments will enable a new class of radiation quantum physics experiments that I've said that already. And 20 years from now, we, we as a scientific community, will have from point one eliminated, sorry for that, I have an opinion, <laughs> this is an opinionated <laughs> slide. We have eliminated the idea of semi classical gravity models. Uh, so, this idea that gravity is so fundamental that you're not even allowed to touch it. Uh, we will have eliminated in passing the idea of ad hoc collapse models, as put out by many people. Um, and we will have found a new key experiment whose outcome has led the way to an almost working quantum theory of gravity. And I'm also convinced that tabletop experiments really will play a very important role in that. Okay, so that's it. That's the group in Vienna. Uh, a couple of people maybe have went out. Um, Gary Cole uh, was actually is the brain behind all our mic microfab and low noise coatings. He has left the group now, has started his own uh, company, but is still. Uh, the strings is strongly collaborating. The levitated resonators um, is actually something where Nikolai Kiesel, Rainer Palt, Meg and Josh Slater are, uh, are leading uh, the efforts. Uh, this our uh, quantum gravity test, the QND measurements, I, I couldn't tell you about uh, Sun and Hong. And um, we do have some quantum information work going on that I didn't show you. This is a bit left <coughs> jerk. And so this is our outings normally. This is how we do quantum physics in Austria. <laughs> so with that I conclude and uh, thanks a lot. So thanks Marcus. This was not just dessert, it was dessert and coffee and <laughs> cognac. <laughs> so cigar. <it's> fantastic. And cigar. <laughs> so it's fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, questions? Comments. You are here how much longer? Two hours or so. Two hours or so. Mm -hmm. So we have two hours to pick his brain. <laughs> Anything? Yeah. Can you tell us about the Q&A? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Briefly, okay? Because I guess some people want to go to lunch. <laughs> okay. Just very briefly the idea of Q&A. Okay. Again, Braginski wrote it down in the most beautiful way. How do you beat the standard quantum limit? <coughs> you have to design the probe in such a way that it only sees the measured observable. I mean, this is this basic idea of this double pump scheme. Okay? So if you have these two, uh, if you have these two, two, two continuous pumps, left and right, um, they beat. Right? And essentially what, what you do is, um, the beat node, you get an amplitude modulation right, at the mechanical frequency. So basically, this is like an optical probe that sits there and just uh, opens the eyes only uh, every time uh, at the mechanical frequency. So uh, only then when you hit, when, when you measure one at the same uh, quadrature. You just do that uh, many times. Right? So this is exactly the idea of this of this, of this scheme. You can also do it in a different way. Instead of having a, a continuous pump that um, just blinks every now and then at the, same, at the, at the, at the correct time, um, you can just make a single shot. So let's say here's your object, right here, your heavy mirror, and you want to know the, you want to know x, the position. Um, just take a very short laser pulse, much much shorter than the than the, the, than, the, than the than the time evolution of the system. Reflect it, yeah, bam, just hit it. And then we are back to our old interferometer uh, the knowledge that the phase actually um, that is encoded on the reflected pulse with respect to some uh, local oscillator that is not affected will depend on the position of your object. Okay? So what you do is by sending a very short pulse ah, on your object and then compare it to a local oscillator is um, you correlate the phase quadrature of your pulse to the instantaneous position because the pulse is so short. And so that means just reading out the phase of the pulse provides you with information about the instantaneous position. And the accuracy now of your position measurement is only bound by the shot noise in the pulse. So that means if you crank up the number of photons, you can make the root n, um, so the shot noise, uh, so and, and, and therefore the phase fluctuation, um, so small that you are below um, the, 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 the standard quantum limit, so the position the variance uh, due to Heisman uncertainty of the mechanical system. But that's the idea. And that is sort of the ideal Q and D measurement. Just a single pulse path, um, and then the, the, the conditional variance um, of your of your mechanical system goes down and down. So, 
Um, so we put that forward in this, in this paper back in 2011, and then we started to do experiments. So um, again, the main idea is in phase space. So this is your, this is your uh, mechanical oscillator in phase space and thermal state. Now comes the pulse, bam! Uh, you measure the phase quadrature, and uh, conditioned on the value of the phase quadrature, um, you know that um, your position uh, um, actually is here with an accuracy given only by the number of photons in your pulse. Okay? And if you do it right, uh, then this accuracy is already smaller than the, uh, than the, than the SQL. Which means you've generated a squeezed state, by the way. Uh, squeezed mechanical state. And then you just let the time evolve. The thing rotates, of course, because it's still mechanical frequency, so it rotates. And if you rotate it by 90 degrees, you do it again. Bam! Okay? What happens then, you cut out here this little thing, and you see you have generated a very cold and tiny squeezed state. So this is also a way of uh, basically uh, a cooling the system. Yeah, just by gaining information. So there's really conditional states um, uh, cooling. Right? This is very similar to, um, to, to what uh, um, uh, Mukun was, was, was talking uh, about yesterday, uh, where you basically just engineer your probe in such a way that you get the right information out of it, and then you condition it. So we did an experiment where um, basically we artificially blew up the temperature to 1000 Kelvin, which is priming it a little bit. Um, because our probe was very weak. So, um, and, and, and then, um, basically, we did exactly that. So we made a single laser shot, and then you see we produced this quash state. So you can actually, um, uh, you, can, you can see that now um, we have this, well, here you can see it more than If this is quash state in, 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 in phase space, then you do it another time, and then you cool it down. Um, the problem here in that case is that the coupling was so weak that you do not get any significant uh, uh, the vicinity to the, to, the, to the quantum regime. So if you put numbers here, oh sorry, okay. if you put numbers here, um, basically there's this, and in essence it boils down to having a single parameter chi, it's a coupling parameter. The inverse of that um, gives you actually the variance in, 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 in phase space. So this has to be larger than one in order to do SQL measurement. And our experiment was 10 to the minus 4. Okay. Um, we are now, uh, we, are now um, we have changed the system. So, we, so this was back then, this was uh, just a floppy cantilever, like the ones that, that Nancy has, um, which is chewing a pulse on that. Okay. But now if you really want to do it correct, you need to have a cavity, send lots of photons, and that's what we're doing now. So we have one of those optomechanical crystal cavities um, that we got uh, from Oscar Painter's group. So essentially, um, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's a zipper cavity, so it is an optomechanical crystal, and uh, you look at the differential motion of those two beams. Right? And there you can if you make them long, you can have frequencies in the hundreds of kilohertz regime, um, uh, uh, you get good mechanical quality factors, you get a huge optomechanical coupling on the order of uh, 500 kilohertz, because nice tiny structures, right? Um, and the chi that you're supposed to get for reasonable values is 4. So you should really uh, go down to, 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 to the 2 um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's the G0 per photon, 0 0.5 megahertz. Yes. That's amazingly large. <laughs> um, and here comes, the, here comes the issue. Multi modes. This is one issue. So the, the mechanical, so this is the, the forest of modes, okay? And um, well, what does it mean if you have multi modes? That means if you go back here, um, you see when it rotates, it rotates with a certain frequency. If you have many modes, um, then basically um, one of these rotates with frequency one of, of mode one, the other one rotates with frequency of mode two. And what you get is you get a blurring here because you have all those different rotation speeds, okay? Um, it's just another way of saying you are not uh, frequency selective when you have a single pulse. Right? You cannot do a Fourier transform because. Um, so you should do a, an echo. Can you do an echo? Like like in like in spins, can you do an echo for this mechanical mode? Is there a way to do that? And then you re you bring it right back, and then you bang it again. Uh, the, the problem is that no you have to invert, the problem is you have to invert something. Yeah, yeah. Right. 
Um, so we don't have a spin that you can invert and then just, so you yeah. somehow have to invert time in, in, in one way. And if you can invert time, you need to invert another parameter, be it spin or something else. Yeah. So what can you invert? Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know yet. There must be a way. I show you a different way. <laughs> a different way is brute force. Um, a different way is just brute force state estimation. It's something they call a Kalman filter. So you can basically, uh, so what we do is, um, before we send the pulse, we have a, a weak beam that drops the system. And based on the information that we get here, we actually predict how the system is going to behave based on the system parameters. So that's, it's, this is a very classical um, known method uh, from control theory. It's actually it's, it's optimal system parameters independently. You can predict the state better. Yeah? It's brute force, but it, it works actually quite nicely. And uh, the point is that, uh, but if, if you do that, then that means um, condition on the state. Uh, you can actually, um, so the, the information that you get actually reduces um, your, um, your, your, your um, uncertainty uh, in the thermal state. Uh, this is just updating your information um, with more phase space information and you can, and this corresponds essentially to cooling by measurement um, from 300 Kelvin down to 15 millikelvin, just, by, um, just by, by, by monitoring the system and making the right which then means for the case of our, um, of our, of our multi-mode problem, if the Kalman filter is off, you see all these modes, if the Kalman filter is on, so we just make state prediction and then subtract the information that we get, we just have a flat line. So this is, all of the modes are cooled down very nicely to below um, a okay. And now you can start working. Okay. Okay. So that's the short version. So this is where we are right now. So we basically, um, we have a system that has very high coupling, um, we think we know how to deal with the multi-mode issue. We still have some electronic noise that we don't understand. So right now, we, if we, do some, we want to do some squeezing, we are like a factor of two or three away from the SQL. Uh, so we still need to work on that. But I think things are starting to get under control. Okay, so that's the, that's the short answer to your question. Okay, more questions? If not, I think that we can um, conclude this school and uh, come back next year okay, and tell us uh, what you want us to do next year. And thanks again so much, Mark. <laughs> it was two cigars in the end. <laughs> okay. You know what happened when you smoke cigars, right? No. It's <laughs>